So I get this message from Etsy from someone who wants to recreate an outfit Cole Phelps wore in the video game L.A. Noire. And I thought how cool would that be to remake an outfit from a hit game? Not only that, but this was going to be for a wedding, and so I knew that this would have to be a project that was well done. No taking shortcuts here. Originally, he wanted to have something like The Outsider with a light gray jacket and a dark pinstripe vest. But I informed him that gray was traditionally a very informal color and would never be worn for something like a wedding. What I told him was that it would be very classy to have a matching three-piece suit made out of the same cloth. So I happen to have a lot of navy pinstripe which I've been saving for a three-piece suit. He loved the idea, and sure enough, as luck would have it, Cole Phelps wore a full navy pinstripe suit in the game called the Sword of Justice, and so I knew this would work out. After a little convincing of his fiance, he came back with a yes answer to me, so I knew I was going to have a fun project coming up. This is going to be a brief overview of the cutting and making process of his suit. I'm going to have to apologize in advance because I didn't focus on documenting every single aspect of the making process since I was worried I wasn't going to have enough time with all the studying I had to do in the process. So that'll have to wait until later with a future video and a future project. In the meantime, this should give a pretty good idea about the overall process for making a suit. The first step was for my customer to take his measurements and send me some posture pictures of himself. It would be rather difficult for me to make a bespoke outfit for someone who I had no idea what they looked like or how they were built. Next, taking the measurements, I tabulated them into my measurement chart I built in Excel. One thing this chart automatically does for me is calculate the working scale and chest scale which is used for making the draft. Back in the day, taking measurements for a suit meant taking your existing suit into the tailor, making the measurements over that, and then duplicating that with any style adjustments. But today, people hardly wear suits, and the ones that they wear are factory made. So because of this, I have my customer take what I call raw measurements over the dress shirt, and then my Excel spreadsheet takes those measurements and calculates the amount needed for overlap for the vest, the coat, the overcoat, and so on. And from there, it makes the working scale and the chest scale. The next step is to draft the pattern. The style we chose for this coat was a stylish 1937 draft of a button 2 lounge coat entitled the Knightsbridge. This coat featured a slender lapel, a slight bit of drape in the chest, and a very flat front edge with very little cutaway around the hip line. The original Sword of Justice suit had three buttons running down the front, but I suggested we bring it down to two in order to show the different layers of the garment. It would be much more appropriate for something showy like a wedding. After making the pattern, the next step is to transfer all of the patterns onto tiled 85 by 11 sheets of paper printed out by my printer at home, and then transfer them to 36 inch plotter paper. The idea for this step came to me from Matthias Wandel of woodgears.ca, so I owe the saved money of sending all of my patterns to FedEx office to him. Once the pattern is transferred and all of the notch marks are made, the next step is to calculate how much fabric I'm going to need by laying it out virtually, again using Illustrator. In this case, the fabric that I had access to was pre-cut into lengths before I bought it, between lengths of 1 and 7 eighths of a yard to 2 and a quarter yards. So by using the pattern pieces that I created in Illustrator and transferring them to a 28 inch virtual layout, I was able to modify the common layout for suit making and best use the fabric that I had available to me. The next step is to prepare the cloth. First you need to line up the pinstripes for the entire length. Next you soak and wring out a length of cotton muslin cloth and evenly lay it over the wool. Then you gently wrap it around a bolt until it's fully covered and then leave it in a nice dark area for about three to four hours. I learned this method through Jason McLaughlin's book The Victorian Tailor and I'll be making a video showing how to do this in the future. With the fabric prepared and ready to cut, I start by laying out the first pieces. Every bespoke suit is cut a little bit differently because it has to match the measurements and the shapes of the individual person. And since this one had pinstripes in it, it was important for me to make sure that I left enough wiggle room around each piece to make sure that I had enough to line up the pinstripes in key locations. Transfer the marks as they are on the pattern, and then I take the pattern piece off and mark down the inlays which surround it. 
These inlays are laid out to allow for expansion later in the case that the customer gains weight or for alterations during the first making of the garments or in case of circumstances that I simply just didn't anticipate. Then it's time to cut. When cutting, I'm keeping in mind to follow the correct set of lines and not accidentally cut into my inlays. Then after the pieces are all cut out, I save the extra cloth left over for the making of pocket jettings, flaps, welts, facings, trouser flies, and most importantly, the sleeves, which will be drafted and cut later once I have the final measurements for the arm side based off of the first fitting. The final step in the cutting process is to make the mark stitches. This transfers all of the chalk markings you made to the piece of wool hiding underneath the top layer. These include the inlays, notches, darts, pleats, facings, turnips of the trousers, and so on. There are different methods for making the mark stitches that I'll cover in later videos. After the mark stitches are made, take the cloth and all the supporting materials like canvases and notions and bundle it up until you or whoever is going to be working on it is ready to begin making up that particular garment. The first step in the actual makeup of the garment is to prepare the canvases and tapes. This involves getting a bucket of room temperature water and taking all of the canvases and tapes and letting them soak, preferably overnight. This lets the canvases shrink before putting them into the garments and not after. If you have a garment that gets wet in the rain after it's been put together and the interlining canvases shrink, you're going to have a blistered, bubbly garment that's going to be ruined forever. While the canvases are soaking, you can start working with the actual garment cloth. The first step in this is to make up the darts. Darts are cut in the cloth that help provide shape. After the darts are made, you need to perform iron work on the cloth. Ironwork shapes the garment further in key locations and helps even out the bubbling that occurs around the darts. I can't stress how important pressing is during the makeup process. Insufficient ironwork can make or break the final product and is practically a skilled master in its own right. If you're making an entire suit, you could begin working on the trousers as well. You start by reinforcing the fork of the trousers, which is where all four parts of cloth come together at the crotch. Next, line the trousers and serge the edges. Then, make up all the fly pieces. For these trousers, I'm making a traditional button fly which uses five small buttons rather than a zipper. Iron work is also performed on the trousers. Some decide to wait until after the first fitting and make it a final step once the entire trousers are made up, and some iron work the pieces separately before adding the lining. After this, some tailors start making the pockets, but some prefer to wait until after the first fitting to make sure there aren't any major alterations to the shape needed. At this point, the canvases should be thoroughly soaked. They need to be left to dry by themselves, or they can be steam pressed. If you press them, make sure not to run the iron over the canvas or you'll undo all of the shrinking you just did. Simply press and then lift, press and lift. The next step is to construct the canvases. This is a crucial step as the canvases will be creating the internal shape and support of the garments. I'm starting with the vest first since it's worn under the coat and it helps ensure that the jacket is the right size and shape on my tailoring form. Once the canvases are constructed, they're based onto the garment cloth. Then the front pieces are attached to the backs. The backs are usually cut from a different material than the fronts, commonly made from lining. Not only does this save cloth, but it makes sure that lining is rubbing against lining once the garments are worn. Next, the canvases for the coat are made and attached. Then the seams are basted, usually by machine, but with a very large stitch using a contrasting thread. These seams will be removed later after the customer tries on the garment, so the contrasting color makes it easily identifiable to remove. Then make the shoulder pads. They make pre-made shoulder pads, but making them from scratch enables me to get the shape and the thickness just the way I want it. The last step before we're finished is to make a half-shaped collar. Once the collar is attached, we're ready to try the garments on the customer. During the fitting, it's important to ask the customer how things feel, if there's any particular areas of discomfort, if they prefer any minor changes to the fit or the style, and so on. It's also important to make sure that there's enough room for breathing. I do the fitting remotely over Skype. This is the only area of the process that I wish could be ironed out, so to speak. Some tailors take seasonal trips halfway around the world just to meet with their customers at this stage. Maybe someday. After all the alteration marks are made, you receive the garment back, take everything apart, make the changes to the cut, 
and then it's safe to put the pockets in. Again, making pockets is a skill in and of itself and takes a lot of mastery. A lot of videos will be covering this later. Rebase the canvases after that, and then it's time to start on the finer details. If everything was looking good, go ahead and fully make up the vest at this point. This includes cutting the inside linings, pressing the facings, etc, etc, and then the bagging begins. I love that term, bagging. There's just something so incendiary about it. After everything is finished, you can finish the buttonholes now or wait for the second fitting. Moving back to the jacket, it's time to pad the lapels. Padding the lapel is fun, at least in my opinion. Not only does the look of a hand padded lapel impress people, but it also serves a crucial function in shaping the role of the lapel. Lots of unknowing dry cleaning places have been known to press a lapel and ruin the hours of hard work it took the tailor to make the gentle roll desired in a bespoke garment, so watch out. I personally don't allow anyone to clean and press my garments but me. It's honestly not that hard to learn, and to do it on your own saves you a ton of money. Once the lapels are padded, then you add the edge tapes, then the facings are added, then the linings, then the internal pockets, and then you finish the under collar, attach it to the top, then you add the shoulder pads, etc, 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 and finally you're ending up with something that starts to look like a real suit. Some tailors prefer to do a second fitting at this point, and some decide to go ahead and start making the sleeves next. I went ahead and made the sleeves since this was a rush order, and I was pretty sure that the garment was fitting very well the way it was already. Constructing the draft for the sleeves involves measuring the armhole, or what tailors call the arm sigh, and then taking those measurements and drafting the sleeves from there so that way it's a proper fit. After the sleeves are attached and the linings are felled over, now it's really time for a final fitting. This is the crucial moment to find out if all of your hard work has paid off. It took about six months for the customer to get some photographs back to me, but when I finally saw them, I was pretty satisfied with what I saw. Not only was this the first time that I had attempted a full three-piece lounge suit, but since I had never actually met the customer in person, or had the chance to fit him or do any alterations directly on his body, I was pretty amazed at the results. I know how hard it is to learn how to tailor. The information is scattered around in endless corners on the net. It's time to put this information into a free collection with videos, pictures, and reading material so you can learn how to do this with others. I need your help. Click here to find out more about how you can be part of this new project headed up by Brass and Mortar.